Well, good morning uh, to you, Dr. Stedward. Thank you for joining me. Uh, thank you for being a willing participant in this conversation about leadership and your path as a leader. Um, we're going to cover off uh, your development as a leader going back to your earliest days um, as a young man growing up in Saskatchewan. And, you know, we'll, we'll continue and certainly touch on your role as founding president of the International Paralympic Committee for for 12 years and you know the the accolades and the recognition and the participation still to this day um, in sport and specifically for uh, persons experiencing disability but as i mentioned earlier I, I, let's maybe maybe we could even start with you know when we're talking about leadership is this how might you define leadership or how might you describe in your own opinion what is a leader and then we'll backtrack a little bit and talk about kind of how you evolved and grew as a leader yourself from uh, from a young man. But maybe we'll start just at the beginning about, I mean, how you would describe or define, um, in your opinion, what leadership is. Well, uh, thank you very much, Dr. Leg, for actually for uh, this. I'm actually looking forward to talking to you uh, about it. I mean, you know a lot of things about me, but there may be a few things that, uh, that you don't. Um, and, you know, when I look at a person who is a leader and leadership generally, you know, I've read so much over my lifetime uh, about people who are publicly recognized as outstanding and great leaders in their own right. And uh, I'm, I'm not so sure whether those people really encapsulate what I believe uh, is leadership and people who are leaders. I mean, there are some wonderful leaders in this world who've never, uh, you know, who people have never met. They're not public, but the impact that they've made on society, their communities, has been a legacy that's lasted a lifetime and eternity. And those are the kinds of people that are leaders, mm -hmm. people who unselfishly uh, work in an environment where their legacy lives on in perpetuity. Hmm. Um, and certainly, I believe that leadership in some, in some degree um, can't be learned, can't be taught. Uh, hmm. It's there. It's inside your heart. It's inside your brain. It's inside your way of life. It's inside your, uh, it's part of the environment in which you were raised and the people who made an impact on you throughout your life. And I know that myself, growing up in a very small, tiny, uh, rural, uh, farming community of Eston, Saskatchewan, um, you always learn, it's just like the original wooden blocks we used when we played with as kids. We took those blocks and we examined them and we said, how can we organize them to build something that makes sense? <laughs> And so that's the way it started with me. It, it was my, my upbringing, uh, the impact that people in the community had on my life. Uh, it was certain teachers who made an impact on my life and certain teachers who made the wrong impact on my life. <laughs> and I said, I'd never wanna be like that person if they're considered to be a leader. So, you know, you listen to those, you reflect on those, you you store those so that you might uh, take them going down the road when you're getting an opportunity to be involved with a group of people where you're at the front leading okay. or you're at the back pushing. Yeah. Um, you know, through my high school, I know I left my hometown quite early in life at 16 because I just felt I wasn't getting the kinds of opportunities um, that I could if I went to the city and lived in residence in a private school where I got more academic and athletic opportunities. 
And that changed me dramatically because, you know, uh, I, of course, I'm not a very big person and I certainly wasn't very big when I was growing up. So you always tend to be the last person who was selected on a team and in a small team, town, that shouldn't work. But I went to the city where you're playing sport at the highest level and I, and I made every single team there, the football team, the baseball team, the basketball team, the track and field team, and even won the provincials in track and field in a couple of events. Uh, so those kinds of things make a positive impact on you that given the opportunity to make a difference, you can make a difference. So just now hang on a second here because you're, you're jumping ahead here pretty quick. So you, Sorry. So you, talk, you talked about these building blocks, your, your analogy of the, of the playing blocks building this foundation mm -hmm. before you went to the city. Now, what city was it that you went to high school? Was it Saskatoon? No, I went to high school at Luther College in Regina. Oh, it was in Regina. Okay. okay. In Regina, yes. Yeah. So, but I, I want to go back to Eston and I want to... I don't want to disagree with you on your comment that you can't learn leadership, but I think I think you can develop as a better leader by learning from great leaders. And I would argue you're, in my opinion, one of them um, by learning about the past, which is, I guess, in part what I'm trying to do here is to understand kind of that foundation that you built. And so that then with other people, they can mm -hmm. learn from those paths and that experience and potentially become better at being a leader themselves. But so the you talked about these blocks and creating a foundation for you while you were in Eston and you, you mentioned, you know, being the last one picked on a couple of teams, but you had, you had, you had a family, how many brothers and you had sisters, I think. I had right? three, three sisters, one older, two younger. Okay. And were they involved in sport? Did they, were they, uh, you think on your leadership? Very, very, very minimally. Okay. Your parents, what about them? What was their, what was their relationship to you as, you know, as far as your leadership development? Um, I wouldn't say very much. Uh, uh, my father, I know, was athletic when he was younger. But, I mean, he, uh, he joined uh, the Navy and went to war when he was underage at 17. So, uh, and then... Is that, is, that, is that him behind you in that picture? Uh, that's correct. Yes, that's uh, that's that's him and his medals and that. But he ended up getting rheumatic fever in the war, so he had to live the rest of his life basically um, with a diseased heart. And so, uh, so his activities were certainly limited. Okay. Um, but I wouldn't say. Uh, my, my, I mean, my parents were very good and they did what they could for me. We weren't very well off uh, and the opportunities weren't great in my, in my early days. Uh, although I did participate in every sport in the town because that's what you did. Um, so I, I don't think, uh, and my father uh, uh, worked uh, as the postmaster in the post office and he took over from his father who started the post office back in the early 1900s so and somehow uh, you did not continue that family tradition of being the postmaster in Eston, Scotland. oh there was absolutely no way in hell that my parents wanted to be anywhere near the post office <laughs> you know because my dad knew what kind of experience he had uh, and also the uh they wanted to make sure that someone in the family got an opportunity to go to university and do something more with their life. <laughs> but you know, you'd mentioned that uh, can't be learned leadership. And I don't believe it can be developed as long as the basic elements are inside the person. Okay. If you've got those, which is inherent and it's part of the DNA and it's part of who you are, you can then grow it. But mm -hmm. it's very difficult to take a person who hasn't had uh, the basic uh, the, the, the basic skills, I would say, okay. um, 
they're not going to be successful because they may not have the right attitude. They may not have the right commitment. They're not prepared to make the kinds of sacrifices that are necessary to be a leader. They may not be committed to uh, becoming a leader. Um, and, and, you know, I, I found out that very quickly as I, later on in my life, as I started to um, meet some of the greatest leaders in the world. You know, the Ayatollah Khomeini from Iran, uh, you know, uh, Nelson Mandela, the president of the United States, uh, the royal family from uh, uh, UK and, and uh, Norway and Sweden and the imperial family from Japan. Meeting all those kinds of people, um, you know you may not understand or agree with their their poli politics and, and their religious beliefs, but obviously they've got something within them that makes them a great leader. So I tried to learn and take their best elements of their leadership and embody them in myself. And that's what I also, all of those people made an impression upon me for certain things, that, skills that they had that I wanted to have, and then I grew them throughout my life. And I can imagine, I mean, the people that you just listed would have been individuals that you would have met through your role with the International Paralympic Committee and likely prior, just prior to that in developing the IPC. That, that, that's my that's, guess. Absolutely. So I'm wondering, so let's, we'll, we'll come to that. And I liked how you started to identify, you know, some of these traits or skills of leaders. We'll come back to those too, but I, I did like that you're starting to already kind of you know, itemize those things. So if, you know, someone says, well, what is it to be a great leader? And, and I, you know, again, like you think about the process that you just talked about learning from, uh, you know, the Royal family, the, the Imperial family in Japan, et cetera, and then trying to figure out how you can then, then incorporate those skills or characteristics or attributes into your own leadership journey. I think it's part of what I'm trying to get from you is so that we can share that with other people and that they can become better leaders themselves too. So I want to I want to go back though chronologically. So we talked we talked about your time in Aston. You said you transferred to Regina to go to Luther College. So that would have been your grade kind of 10, 11, 12 years. Yeah, 11, 12. Okay. Yeah. So any any significant kind of moments there that you can reflect back on and think that those were fundamental or foundational in your development as a leader? I realize well, it's going Yeah, sure. I guess the uniqueness, I guess the uniqueness of being at a private school there are different opportunities and different privileges. And being not only a private school, but living in residence offered even more because now all of a sudden you're living in a dormitory with 50 other guys uh, and you may or may not have a roommate. You might be in a single room or you might be in a double room, uh, depending, like grade 12, you always got a single room, grade 11, it could be either one. But, you know, what I learned uh, on the, the different personalities of all these guys I had to live with, it's different going to school with someone where you're there in a classroom setting than it is when you're going for breakfast, lunch, and supper and being in the dormitory at night. No. Totally different kind of experience. And again, that provided me with, again, just something that was churning in me that I learned from that experience. Um, and also being in a private school, uh, I mean, we started about three weeks later than the public schools did. So we had three, three weeks of, of an opportunity to uh, be gym rats or uh, our, our football team spent three weeks training. So again, you got to work and be part of a team where you're with each other morning, noon, and night. So again, it provided a, now the sport comes out. Sport is one of the greatest teachers of becoming a leader that I've ever experienced. Uh, because of what it does for you and, you know, the discipline, the maturity, the uh, the pressure and all of those kinds of things that you naturally learn in sport. Now, there's a hell of a lot of athletes that 
know that exists, but they don't learn from it. And that's mm. what will separate uh, an outstanding athlete from just an ordinary athlete. Mm. And so that uh, I learned very quickly um, at Luther. Mm. And then uh, having the kind of coaching that I did and how quickly I, I uh, elevated myself from just being not even making the team to be one of the better athletes on the football team or basketball team or baseball team or at track and field. So, it, you know, when I saw what I was able to achieve in that living in residence in that private school, boy, oh boy, that I said, there's no limit what a person can achieve. And I'm an example because I was here and before I left, I was there. Hmm. So, uh, and, and it was because of the opportunities, the experiences, the teaching, the coaching that I had from coaches and other teammates alike. Hmm. So what is it that led you to go to Luther College? Why did you choose to do that? Go well, um, a, a very close friend of our family, uh, their son, who was two years older than me, went to Luther College, and I saw how he excelled uh, from being in Eston to going to Luther College. So uh, if you're going to go to uh, another school or you want to sprout your wings, so to speak, uh, there weren't that many opportunities uh, in Saskatchewan. I mean, there was another private school in a very small community, but I didn't want to go to a small community. Uh, I, I could have gone to Notre Dame because uh, I was playing high level hockey at the time. Um, but when we checked into Notre Dame, we looked at their reputation, we looked at the conditions of, you know, under which you were living. And again, it was in a little town. It was in Weyburn, right? Yeah. Uh, just, yeah, just south of Regina in, in Notre Dame, yeah. And, and so when you're in Regina, all of a sudden now you're competing not at level B, C, or D, you're competing at A level sport. So, and we had a small school. We only had, in grade nine to 12, we only had 350 students in the entire school, half day students and half boarding students. But we were competing against you know, Bell for Tech and some of these schools that had 2,000, 1,500 students in them. Uh, and yet we were ranked uh, one, of the, one of the highest achieving sporting schools in the province because hmm. the school attracted strong right. academics and good athletic uh, hmm. skills. Hmm. Okay. So you were, you were there at Luther College. What, what made you decide to, did you go straight to the University of Alberta from Luther College? Uh, yes, I did, yeah. But what made you, What? where was the impetus to do that? Well, uh, again, um, uh, another fellow I grew up with in Aston was a couple of years older than me. And, uh, and he went to uh, University of Alberta uh, and took dentistry. And he was a bit of a hero of mine. Uh, because he was a great uh, athlete and he was an outstanding academic student. And he went to uh, U of A and took dentistry and he became a legend in, in dentistry. I mean, there's likely no one that has a greater reputation in the world in dentistry for some of the research and some of the surgeries that he was doing because he was a he was a he was a surgeon, a facial surgeon. So any time there were major motor vehicle accidents of any kinds or gunshot, he was the one that was flown all over the world to do the surgery. Oh. Murray Mickerborough was his name. We called him Mickey. And so he went before me. So I said, "Well, I better follow in his footsteps." Hmm. So I did. Because you didn't you didn't take physical education initially. Was... No, no, no. I was uh, I was in pre dentistry. Uh, you know, and then I struggled, and I don't know why I struggled. That still behooves me, but I struggled academically uh, at the time because the pre-dent program was very, very tough. 
and I didn't do very well in a couple of my subjects uh, during those first couple of years. And, you know, and I would start to think, well, maybe dentistry isn't for me as well as a, as a profession because I was really missing sport. So I cut out a lot of my sport because I felt I had to, I had to spend all of my time doing my academic work. So I didn't go out for the Golden Bear hockey team or the football team at the time. Uh, I did, uh, I I didn't my first year, but my second year, I came back and, and was uh, joined the track team. But again, I missed sport. I was heavy into academics. But then the social aspect of high school at Luther wasn't there as much because it was a, a Luther College. It was a religious school, private school, lived in residence. So you were kept on a short leash, but all of a sudden you're at university and holy moly, there I go. So the civilization <laughs> caught up to me. So I ended up uh, spending a year, a uh, year and a half, I guess, of my life out of university. Huh. And I went back, I went back to Saskatchewan to Eston. I took on the job of, of doing carpentry work because I did that when I was a kid and I really enjoyed it. And I started doing this kind of work. And then I came back to Edmonton and worked at ChemCell in one of their labs. And I soon realized that this ain't the life for me. This, this wasn't what I was meant to be. I've got to get back to university. I've got to get back into sport uh, and try to make an impact in that area at university. So that's when I came back to the University of Alberta in uh, in physical education. So that's a part of your life I did not know. Yeah, yeah. It uh, it was, boy, it had its up to, I mean, that taught me, that was likely the greatest experience that I had that taught me so much about what I wanted to do, about developing the maturity, the discipline, the, the yeah. focusing, the, the passion, about what I wanted to do, and certainly what I didn't want to do. Right. So that was that those two years, sort of in that area, was 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 a, a huge uh, growing curve. I didn't want dentistry, but I knew I wanted to get back at university because I didn't want to work on the end of a shovel or work in a lab, you know, pouring acid all over myself every day. So, uh, so. So I got back into university and uh, I met with the dean at the time, Maury Van Vliet, <laughs> and uh, he threatened me with an inch of my life. He said, I will let you under one condition. You have to take a full load and I want you passing every subject and I want you to have an A average after the first term. And uh, he obviously knew I was capable of doing it. So I went from being a failure at university to topping the class. Hmm. So, uh, because I was motivated, you know, I had something to do. And that was about the same time that year was the same year I got involved in sport for people living with a disability, 1967. So let's let's just take a just yeah before we before we get to that part of your story. So I just I think it's worth noting. So Murray Van Vliet, of course, is extremely well known in the University of Alberta context. It's the Van Vliet Building that physical education kinesiology is now housed, globally recognized as a leader within physical education sport. And I think it's I think it's an interesting anecdote that you provide where somebody believed in you. Um, and then you aspired to meet those expectations um, after having experienced perhaps a couple of years of doubt and um, I don't know questioning your own abilities perhaps. Oh, uh, absolutely! I think that's I think that's I, th I think that's a really good you know anecdote to the leadership journey that you took. That another person demonstrated great leadership by showing their faith in your abilities and 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 expecting you and setting a very high bar for you to hit. Um, which, which you did. So, yeah. so you came back to the University of Alberta. Uh, you're enrolled in physical education, and again, you're recognized globally as you know, one of the preeminent leaders within sport and recreation for persons 
with disability. And this is where you said you got your start with it. So let's, let's, let's go back to that and talk a little bit about kind of how that came about. Yeah. Uh, well, and, and even before that, the two, those two years when I was out of university and it was so, um, frustrating. I mean, I obviously went through, which I didn't know at the time, likely a lot of anxiety, a lot of depression, a lot of frustration, not knowing who I am, where I'm going, and I just saw myself as a failure. So that's why uh, Maury Van Vliet saved my life. Hmm. He, you know, he saw something in me that I can succeed, and he put that trust and faith in me that I could succeed. But also if I didn't, I wouldn't get another opportunity. <laughs> so uh, so he certainly did show me that guiding light and uh, which was, you know, I could never, uh, I mean, so when you talk about the Nelson, Mel uh, Nelson Mandela and the Ayatollah and all these other unbelievable people around the world that I've had the uh, pleasure uh, of, uh, of meeting and knowing, uh, how many people around the world would know Maury Van Vliet? Right. Not many, and yet he was one of the greatest leaders in physical education and sport in North America. Right. I mean, how many people do you know that can be an all-American in four sports? <laughs> you know, he was truly unbelievable. So I just, I hung on every word he told me <laughs> during that interview and subsequent to that. And we ended up becoming very, very, very dear friends. Mm -hmm. You know, I was like family to him, I suppose, in many ways. And so as soon as I came back to university, and what, you know, coincidentally, you know, the day I started back in university was five days after, or a week after I got married, too. So obviously that had an influence also uh, that I wasn't coming back as a uh, as a as a so, as a social being that I was before that. I just had to curb it a little bit uh, after getting married. <laughs> oh, whatever. <laughs> I didn't realize that you and Laura were married that young. Yes. Yeah, we were just coming twenty-two. We were twenty-one, coming Holy twenty-two. Lord. How many years have you, have you been married? Now? Fifty-four. Fifty-four years. Yeah, coming up fifty-five. Yeah, yeah, there's a long a, time. There's a, there's a leadership uh, journey just in and of itself that we won't oh, we won't go yeah. down on this video, but uh, absolutely, yeah, yeah. How, does it, how, how did how did the two of you meet? Well, uh, Laura was grew up in a small farming community outside of Calgary in in Strathmore, and but they also had a house in the city, so. The girls, uh, once the uh, three girls, once they got into grades two, three, four, or somewhere around there, the mum felt it was more important for them to go to school in the city. So the dad would live on the farm in the week, and then they'd go out to the farm on weekends. Uh, but she graduated from uh, high school, Crescent Heights, in, in, in Calgary. But, of course, she had two older sisters that went to U of A, the, her older sister through physiotherapy and her next oldest sister in physical education. Oh. So, uh, so she, uh, so Laura, uh, obviously had to come to U of A. So one of the first days of meeting uh, of of being in Frosh Week, there was always, of course, Frosh Week was a week long because you did all of your registering of courses by hand, walking around to the buildings, getting into them. And there was always big events, noon and at night, on campus. So I was in the main gym of the Van Vliet Center, and uh, a bunch of us from, from the residence I was staying in saw these girls sitting in the stands, and they, I didn't see any guys around them, so we figured we better infiltrate uh, this group of women. So we did. And at the time, if you were uh, a first year student living in St. Steve's College, you had to walk around campus with your shirt inside and out and backwards, one pant leg, and you wore a billboard that said your name and where you were from. 
and it said, I am an ignorant, insolent St. Steve frosh. <laughs> and then the seniors made us go around the campus and collect girls' names and telephone numbers. <laughs> so, uh, so I met Laura sitting in the stands, and I said, well, I need to get your name and phone number. So she wrote it on the card, and I circled it. She said, well, why'd you do that? He said, oh, I only do that for the special ones. She said, well, how come about 90% of them are circled? <laughs> well, I said, I've met a lot of special women today. <laughs> but again, one more, one more peg uh, that I learned, uh, you know, through that process and procedure. So we were on again, off again for, uh, for about three years, I guess, and then uh, ended up uh, marrying in 67 because we met in first year 1964. Wow. Yeah. You're a lucky man, Dr. Stedward. Yes, she is. Yeah. <laughs> I am. Yeah. Okay, okay. So going back, so you're in first year yeah. physical education now. Um, and you talked about having an opportunity to start to get involved in sport and recreation for persons with disability, which yep. you know, has, has certainly become your calling card as a leader. Um, but let's let's talk about kind of your earliest experiences with that. Well, um, when when I was in first year back at university, um, Van Vliet had agreed to host the first uh, CWSA Canadian Wheelchair Sports Association National Championships in 1968. Um, because that, that fall or the, and that summer fall was when we were, uh, uh, when CWSA was created. Uh, and in fact, there was a toss up that we might have to change our wedding dates because, <laughs> uh, there were two things. One, uh, I was coaching baseball and we were going to the national championships and the other one was the Pan American wheelchair games in Winnipeg. But, you know, uh, I decided that I wouldn't go to the Pan Ams, that I would <laughs> go to the wedding instead. So we did. And uh, during that fall, uh, Van Vliet, of course, had asked me if I would be interested in working with the organizing committee for the first games, which I said, absolutely, of course, because by then I saw the value in doing more than sitting in a classroom, taking notes from a professor who likely wanted to be anywhere but there. And uh, so uh, I said, yes, because that's going to give me some experiences that I can use in my classes and hopefully build a career which i didn't know that it was going to do at the time i just i just want to pause, i want to pause for one quick second so just to provide a little bit of context so the pan am games that you made reference to in winnipeg in 67 yes at that point in time those are the very first time that there was a wheelchair pan am games mm -hmm. if, I, if i recall correctly right? and it was al simpson and part of his i forget what they called it but it was like the monday night club or something like that and they petitioned host organizing committee in Winnipeg to do so. So ultimately they hosted a, a wheelchair division of the Pan American. Yes, because separate, right? the, the host of the Pan American Games in Winnipeg, they were not prepared to host the right. wheelchair section of the games. So Al and some of his friends in Winnipeg said that uh, if they could get support from the uh, municipal government and the provincial government that they would host them themselves, which they did. Okay. And then they also, at the same time, uh, a group of them came together. Uh, Doug Mowat from BC, Vic Q from BC, uh, Bob Jackson from Toronto came together and said, we're going to create a new national organization. Okay. They didn't form it there uh, because what had happened is after the games, the centennial wheelchair games were held in Montreal. Oh, so right. Right, right, right. Just a small group of games, and that's where they formally registered and voted in the first 
uh, governing board of the CWSA. And again, just to provide some context, because Canada hadn't participated in the Paralympic Games yet. The first games were in 60 in Rome. The second were in Tokyo in 64. And the third games would have been the following year in 68 in Tel Aviv. That's correct. Um, and, and Canada was there. But so, so Jackson took a team to the 68 games, Robert Jackson. Took yeah, actually, um, oh, who was it? Might have been Lionel Fournier from U of A. Oh, okay. No, no, I, he he wasn't. Lionel Fournier took the team to uh, to the first uh, to the Pan American Games in '69 in Argentina. Okay, '68. Bob Jackson took them to uh, yes, because I can remember that now. Uh, you'll have all those files. I've I've saved <laughs> I've saved the write ups to all of those. Uh, but I want the, the reason I'm bringing this up is because the games at the University of Alberta were held as a tryout for the 68 games, or were they post the 68 games? No, they were they were the trials. That's where we selected the the athletes for the 1968 uh, okay, game. Okay. That's right. And uh, so I was involved with that. Uh, Lionel Fournier, who is a former Olympic. Uh, uh, athlete uh, for Canada in, in athletics, track and field. Of course, Maury Van Vliet, uh, uh, Bob Jackson, and a few others. So uh, there was quite an extensive group of meetings uh, because oh, we had. Okay. And how are we going to choose? Are we going to choose them by region or by athletic ability? And they said, these are the Paralympics. We have to go by athletic ability, which some people were concerned about that. And so this is really where you kind of cut your teeth. Um, oh, absolutely. It's exactly where, where it happened. That's, I mean, that's, it was during that year in 67 leading into 68 where I was uh, coaching the, uh, uh, the wheelchair basketball team, the swimming team, the athletics track and field team in preparation for 68. Hmm. So why, like, why, yeah, what, why did you choose to go down that path? Um, well, it was an opportunity that I hadn't had before. It was new to me. Hmm. Um, Van Vliet thought it was a good idea to get involved. Uh, I could see opportunities there uh, because I look back at the, uh, I mean, I was very fortunate uh, prior to that, uh, how I was treated as an athlete. Uh, I mean, you had your letterman's jacket and all the cheerleaders loved you. And you, you know, at the provincial championships in track and field when I won, I mean, all of a sudden the newspapers wanted to talk to you and take, I said, you had the opportunities to be up on a pedestal. But these people that were, of course, in those days, they were all using a wheelchair to compete, uh, leg amputees and spinal cord injured and cerebral palsy. So there wasn't, uh, no one knew who they were. No one cared about who they were. Uh, they faced barriers every single day of their life, uh, whether it be in not having a job, so employment was scarce. Uh, none of them went to school because uh, educational opportunities weren't available for them. Some of the younger kids were still living in a in a hospital and they didn't have schooling there. So I really saw that there was a terrific need, uh, but more so uh, a great opportunity to make a difference and leave a legacy. Okay, okay. So you, you were coaching, you said the wheelchair basketball team, the swimming team leading up to these games in 1967 held at the University of Alberta. So tell me a little bit about that experience with those games coming to you then. Well, um, as they say, the, the coaching started in the fall of 67, and then the summer of 68, we hosted the game. So uh, when they came, of course, accessibility was was pretty poor at the time. So from 67 to 68, we were... We were uh, we had the university who was great. The physical plant there uh, got all sorts of supplies and built us ramps uh, to uh, to get them into the inaccessible 
Lister Hall living area. We had to build ramps in the van, which is now known as the Van Vliet complex, the phys ed complex, so that they could get in and around various places. We started to modify the bathrooms, uh, etc. We had to make all of the uh, all of the equipment for the um, uh, the one sport that they did the uh, uh, up ramps, down ramps, around pylons, and all like that. Like an obstacle, the obstacle, the course. obstacle course, of course. Uh, so those all had to be built, mm -hmm. and then of course, what happened after the games? Those were donated back to CWSA uh, to use as they saw fit. So I the experience that first year was such that at um, you know, I was, it was like going down a rabbit hole or going down a road and then it branched off into 12 yellow brick roads and which one do you take right. uh, and hope you choose the right one. So uh, that's when I started, learned how to start making informed decisions by listening to people, by keeping open-minded, um, but eventually having to make a decision. Right. Again, so, it's leadership. Yeah, yeah. So again, we're coming back to those characteristics and descriptors of leadership, which is good. So, so you volunteer with the games, 68 Paralympic Games take place in 68. So Canada is now participating in a Paralympic system. Um, you've been involved now with, again, at a... I would say not a not a immediate level, but certainly a distal level. The creation of the Canadian Wheelchair Sport Association. Um, what what happened in years two, three, and four of your physical education undergraduate degree? That like walk me through kind of the evolution of you as a leader within oh, disability sport. Well, uh, during I guess during my coursework, I saw that there was more value when I was taking a sport admin course. And in that, I mean, you learn everything from setting up a tournament to doing human resources, to doing budgeting and economics and marketing and all those kinds of things. So I started seeing that academic side with the practical side that I was gaining through the my coaching and through the organizing of the 68 uh, wheelchair games. So I thought, hmm, I'd better start using that experience. And that's where I started excelling at some of those other courses that I'd never been exposed to before. But because I was able to bring the practical side with the academic side together, and then at the same time, uh, I became involved with the CWSA uh, representing uh, Alberta. So it was sort of from after 68 for the next, because by then I'd finished my first year. So then of university again. So all of a sudden now, what's going to happen in the next two years? Well, Who's going to host the nationals in '69 and '70? Are there any uh, the Are there any other uh, major events that are going to come up? Well, yes, the Pan Ams are going to be hosted by Jamaica in 1971, uh, but also Canada wanted to go to Stoke Mandeville for the first time in 1971. So by then. Uh, I was athletic director of the Canadian Wheelchair Sports Association, Alberta division. Okay. Uh, so I started to have an influence on team selection and on uh, putting the team together to go to these other events. So the first thing they did in 1969, 70, going in that area, is they appointed me as the... Uh, uh, general manager and chef de mission of the 1971 um, Para Pan American Games for um, for Jamaica. I didn't know that either. Yeah, so it was, uh, you know, they said, would you like to do Stoke Mandeville or would you like to do the Pan Ams? Well, I said, we just had a Pan Ams in two years. I think there's an opportunity to build on that. 
where the uh, Stoke Mandeville was already in <laughs> in an ongoing uh, set of games every year. So, uh, so I worked uh, to put that team together, and I actually worked very closely with Al Simpson on that. Okay. Because of his experience uh, with the '67 Pan American Games, right. so it made sense, and also with my experience in helping Lionel Fournier putting the team together for the 69 games, Pan American games in um, Argentina. Hmm. And, uh, but I didn't go to the Argentina games because I, of other commitments uh, uh, that I had. Uh, but I, but I would have gone as the chef de mission, but, because of other commitments, I couldn't. So that's when Lionel Fournier took the team there. Okay. Uh, but then I'd already, and also by then I was involved with CWSA as as um, as the athletic director or the sports guy or whatever. And then on to Jamaica. And that was like the CWSA Alberta division was as a volunteer. So this is you're doing this while you're an undergraduate student. Yes, because, uh, well, no, uh, by then, uh, David, see, I had graduated with my undergraduate degree in 69. And oh. then I was a graduate student in 69, 70. So, you're all, so this is during when you're doing your master's degree. At the That's correct. And That's, who, was your, who, were, who was your supervisor? Uh, my supervisor there was uh, Mohan Singh. Oh, okay. Yeah. So because I was doing it more in uh, exercise physiology area. Okay. And so during that time though, uh, I was still coaching locally. Uh, and I also created the, because at the time we were preparing to go to national games, but it was always done under the auspices of a Edmonton organization called PSA, Paralympic Sports Association. Right. And the government then at the time said, we won't deal with a club. You have to have a provincial organization. So when I was sitting on the pool deck of the East Pool at U of A with uh, Boots Cooper and Elaine L and uh, Keith Wary from Calgary and myself, we said, all those in favor, we're going to have a provincial <laughs> sport organization. Yes. So I took their names. They signed a document. And then I started again what I needed to do to create a, a new not-for-profit organization. And then we use that to get our provincial money. And so I started as the president of that organization um, uh, as well. Wow. There's, there's a, there's gonna, I think by the end of this conversation, there's going to be a long list of organizations and associations that will have had your name involved. Um, yeah. Yeah, and the names. I mean, just you know, Wary Cooper, Elena, like those are those are iconic names within. Yeah, the, Stu, Warrior, Stu Warrior. I mean, there are so many of them. In fact, I was I converted a bunch of my slides to pictures a few years ago, and I I go back and uh, relive those that they're uh, yeah. they they bring back uh, many many special memories. So listen, I, I I was just checking the time, so I think. I want to I want to finish up our conversation from your leadership development from when you finished your PhD at the University of Oregon. So let's let's get to that point. So you're okay. you're you're doing your master's degree at the University of Alberta with Dr. Singh. You're continuing yeah. to volunteer. You've created Alberta's uh, wheelchair sport association or Canadian wheelchair sport association Alberta section. Yeah. Um, after having helped create the PSA Paralympic Sport Association, yeah. it, that was Edmonton based and and continues to this day. Um, in both cases. So talk about the transition from your master's degree to moving to Oregon to do your PhD. Um, sure. And that, sure. That well, in, uh, when I did my, when I went on to my master's degree, that was in 6970. Partway through that, uh, that master's program, um, the chairman of the Department of Physical Education, Max Howell, another very famous uh, icon in, in physical education. He said, uh, I have absolutely no experience in administration. If you want me to be the department chairman, you're gonna have to give me an assistant. So he came to me and 
69, when just after I graduated, and asked me because he'd heard about my involvement in wheelchair sport, and he also heard how well Van Vliet told him, you've got to hire this guy because he's a, he's a leader in the rough, and uh, you need him. So uh, I went to him, and I said that because uh, Howell wasn't going to be the chairman until <clears throat> the summer of 70. So at least that gave me a year to get all my coursework done, and then I just had my thesis to do. So I got hired as, uh, as an academic and administrator called an APO, an Administrative Professional Officer, in 1970 in the summer on faculty. I did not know that either. Yeah, and I had both teaching and administrative responsibilities. So I was Max Howell's assistant, plus I taught uh, anatomy, uh, administration, athletic injuries, uh, et cetera. And so, uh, and during that year of my master's, I also was on the track team. So it was a pretty busy, pretty busy year for me. And married. Yeah, the, the interesting thing though, is that uh, at that time, Max Hall was loved to travel. So he said, uh, we've got to organize a trip. As soon as he says we, it means me. <laughs> so I organized the first trip of uh, professors from across the country to go to go to Russia, Czechoslovakia, and Hungary in the summer of 1970. So this is this is during the Cold War. That's right, absolutely. So it was there was some a lot of restrictions, and we had to have a lot of advice and education by the RCMP what we can and can't do. So we went, and it was a huge success. We were gone for, uh, I believe we were gone for about four weeks between the three countries. Wow. When we came back, uh, I was still, uh, well, I was on faculty then, of course, uh, but as an APO. So I said, you know, uh, we've got to find another place to go. So Max and I sat down and I said, well, China's closed. Uh, so we sent a letter to the embassy of China and to our government. And we said, we'd like to take a, a group of uh, professional educators in the area of sport and recreation to China. <laughs> so we were the first group uh, during the Cultural Revolution to get permission to go into China. The only person who'd been there before us a few months before that was the president of the United States. So Richard Nixon, this was, or no, Nixon. was it? Yeah, so uh, we were the first group and I organized that group as well. So you can see that administration, administrivia was my thing. Yeah. And then, but also I had to bring people together to coordinate what they were going to do. And I had to also coordinate my activities with embassies and government and, and China and all that. So that, uh, that sort of took us into 1972. At the same time, I was the head coach of the Paralympic team in Heidelberg. So it was... Uh, and those, those are the 72 Paralympic Games with the Olympics having been held in Munich. Right. That, that's okay. right. Yes. So uh, then, then over the next few years, I was basically on faculty at teaching and at research because I and Van Vliet had really encouraged me to go on to finish my PhD. But I said, I, I, I don't have time. I'm doing this and that and the other thing. And I was the chef de mission of the 1976 Paralympic Canadian team for Toronto. Uh, but so I said, I will do something about it when those games are over. Hmm. Well, no, he said, you'll do it now and try to, and then, but leave after the games are over. <laughs> so basically I, I applied uh, to Oregon because for a number of reasons, I wanted to continue to extend my anatomy knowledge with uh, Dr. Edna Wooten, who was, who's again an icon from the Esslinger bunch down in Oregon and Lou Osterneg, 
who was in adapted PE and athletic injuries. So it was all my bailiwick. Even though administration was my strength, that wasn't that was my avocation. My right. education was the academic side. <laughs> so I got accepted. And so I think when I got back from Toronto from the Paralympics in 76, two weeks later, Laura and I were off with a, with a uh, three-month-old and a 13-month-old child to, uh, wow. to Oregon, packed up our our van and and off off we went to Oregon for uh, for two years. Let's let's pause there and let's pick this up. Let's pick this story up when we meet again. Sure. Okay. Is it going okay for you? Hang on.